our scripture reading for this evening is Colossians 1, 1 through 8. It says, <coughs> Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints, and faithful brethren in Christ, who are Colossians, grace to you and the peace from God, our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ. Jesus, and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before the word of truth of the gospel, which has come to you, as it has also in the world, and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God and truth as you learned from the Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ of your belief, who has also declared your love in the Spirit. Thank you, Will, so much. And as uh, mentioned this morning, I was looking forward to this lesson, thinking about uh, the sermon this morning, and, and made references to the upcoming sermon. And uh, I particularly uh, contemplate the words of Paul in his second letter to Timothy, as he writes there in verse 16, he says, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me, and was not ashamed of my chain. And certainly uh, we understand the role of the preacher, the role of the minister, and we spent time contemplating that and studying that together uh, this morning. Uh, but the congregation also plays a role and can uh, in and of itself be an encouragement and minister not only to one another, but also, as mentioned this morning, uh, to the leadership and, and, and even to the preacher, to the minister. Um, I cannot tell you how many times I have been so grateful to be able to assemble here on Wednesday evening or to be able to, to come and gather with you on the first day of the week or uh, even on a Saturday when we've come together for some kind of uh, activity or some kind of event and just be encouraged by your fellowship and by your love in the faith. Uh, just as Paul is detailing there regarding the brethren in Colossae uh, and how he describes them and their faithfulness. Um, it has a tremendous impact on uh, one who is uh, looking to, to preach and to teach, but also uh, just the encouragement and the bond and the uh, ability to be vulnerable and to be exposed from an emotional perspective, from a mental perspective, uh, to a group of people who love you, who care for you, who desire the best for you in view of the gospel. And that is what is obviously the best for us when it comes to our eternity. And, and so this evening, uh, let us contemplate the roles of uh, the church and members of the body of Christ. Obviously, we understand that there are roles throughout things such as our worship service. There are those that are able to sing, those that are able uh, to, to pray, those that are able to read Scripture, those that are able to, to teach Bible class and do all kinds of various things regarding specific services of the Lord's church, but there are also those who have the ability to uh, really stir up each other and, and build up one another in other various forms and ways that maybe we don't immediately contemplate and consider. And for that, the church is blessed, and uh, it is such a, a great uh, encouragement, again, to have this kind of friction, healthy friction, with one another. Paul writes of the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He writes, beginning there in verse 12, he says, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. 
For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Uh, if the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased Him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are, there, are they many members, yet but one body? And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head unto the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need. But God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the, the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. If one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. You know, when I think about uh, our world today and this idea of unity, this idea of love, I really contemplate uh, and consider their, their futility in these endeavors because they're doing it from a secular perspective. And obviously it's not achieved. What we really see regarding unity, regarding love, uh, regarding this idea of, of being able to come from all different places and, and perspectives and backgrounds and, and find a level of commonality, it only exists in Christ and it only exists in the church. Uh, and Paul here is writing this to the Corinthian brethren concerning their roles and concerning uh, the divisions that they obviously are being bombarded with and tempted with, as Paul will note in the first chapter of the same letter, beginning there about verse 10. They had issues because they thought themselves better than others because of their abilities, because of what it is that they could do, what it was that they were blessed with. And unfortunately, they were not allowing uh, brotherly love, brotherly unity, as the psalmist writes, as the Hebrews writer writes in Hebrews 13 and verse 1, to continue. And so when we think about the membership ministering, we have to begin by really understanding that every single one of us have an opportunity to add value, to bring significant impact and influence to the Lord's church. Sometimes we do the unfortunate uh, oversimplification of saying, well, the elders, well, the preacher, well, uh, if we had deacons, they're the ones that have some kind of impact or influence regarding the body of Christ. Not so, and we see that pointed out here in Paul's letter to the brethren in Corinth. Every single member plays a part, and even those members that we would not consider to be comely. In other words, those members that are out front, that are in the spotlight, in actuality, in the body of Christ, they are of extreme value, even though they are not front and center. Why? Because ultimately, God is the one that is deserving and that receives all the glory in the church. Again, note the very first chapter, verses 29 through 30 of uh, 31 of this same letter. And so let us consider then, uh, going back to this uh, epistle to the Colossae brethren, in the first chapter, how it is, and, and really what it's all about concerning members ministering. So let's begin uh, by going back to the passage and first ask the question, why is it that members, why is it that members would minister? Why is it that members would minister? Notice with me here in verse 5 in the beginning. He says, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. For the hope that is laid up for you in heaven. Well, what is it that they are doing? What is it that's going on regarding this hope that is laid up for them in heaven? Well, uh, they have faith in Christ Jesus, verse 4. They have love to saints, verse 4. Why is it that that exists? Why is it that that is? Well, they, they're aware of the fact that they're not living for this world, but they're living and, and basing their life, their entire uh, reason for being on hope, on that which they cannot see. 
Paul will give us a good description of what hope is all about in the Romans letter. In chapter 8, beginning there in verse 19, he says, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. The earnest expectation. In other words, I desire it and I expect it to happen. Translated hope. Notice verse 20. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Folks, when we hope for something, it's not that we wish for, it's not that we just casually kind of think about it, but we have an earnest for it, we have a, a desire for it to happen, and we expect it to happen. Let me ask you a question this evening. Do you expect to go to heaven? You ought to as a child of God. Just as Paul had expected to as he was writing uh, to Timothy as we studied this morning, following those first five verses in uh, chapter 4 of the second letter, he goes on and explains, verses 6 to 8, that he knows where he is going. And we should be able to know the same, just as Peter explains to us how that's possible in his second epistle in chapter 1, verses 5 and following. We can know where we're going and we ought to expect it. And obviously, we ought to desire it. Now you might say that's an easy one, preacher. Of course we desire to go to heaven. But here's the question. Do you desire to go to heaven more than you desire to be in this world? In other words, do you desire spiritual things, things that you cannot see, things that you are looking forward to beyond these skies, as it were, rather than material things, things that we look to hold on to here in this life? What do you have a greater desire for? Well, those in Colossae, the reason why it was that they were able to serve one another, minister to one another, care and love one another, was because they were all about heaven above. Uh, they were all about uh, uh, not this world, but this world uh, is not was not their home. It's not their home. It's not our home. Notice as well the language there. It's laid up. They recognized it as something that was laid up. Jesus gives us a good explanation as to what this is all about. In Matthew chapter 6, He records the words of Jesus. Starting there in verse 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Uh, what does it mean to lay something up? To lay something up. Well, it means that you've made a certain investment. You don't necessarily get to capture that immediately, but it's laid up for you, reserved for a time that is yet to come. And so therefore, you're looking forward to it. So they saw heaven, they saw their lives as being a continual investment for not this world, but that which was and that which is uh, heaven above. So that's why it was that they were able to serve. Uh, how is it possible that they ever reached this point? How is that possible? Uh, point number two. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 1. And notice here the second part of verse 5. The second part of verse 5. Uh, Paul says, Whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Well, how is it that they're able to minister for one, to one another? What is it that made that possible? What's the source? What's the lifeblood? Let me ask you this. When you think about ministry, what does it really boil down to? What really does it mean to minister, right? Uh, you have folks, especially in uh, foreign countries. Uh, Britain is a great example right now and all the chaos that's going on over there. Uh, they have them uh, you know, uh, called uh, PMs and MPs, members of parliament, the prime minister, ministers of parliament. What are they? They're servants. They're servants of the country. What does it mean to be a minister? It means to serve. And so as a member of the congregation, we get an opportunity to serve one another, but where is it that we go to to uh, really leverage power and, and strength to be able to do it? Serving is not an easy thing to do. It gets wearisome. It gets tiresome. It can be a thankless task at times. So how then are we capable to be able to do this? Well, uh, let's contemplate again the second part there in verse 5. They heard the word of the truth of the gospel. Well, we already looked at the fact that they were doing this because they were looking to something beyond this physical world. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Paul will say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and in verse 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. 
Uh, he stated it there in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, how faith comes, hearing by the Word of God. So uh, they're able to do what they're able to do. They're able to uh, look to heaven rather than to this physical world because they're walking by the Word of God, that which they are hearing, that which is powerful and capable to give them the strength they need in order to press on and to continue on, to live sanctified, cleansed lives, pure lives in Christ, so that they're not distracted by this physical world and instead living in the sanctity of the gospel. Jesus will uh, state in his prayer in John chapter 17 and verse 17, he's praying to his father, he says, sanctify them by thy truth, thy word is truth. Uh, folks, if we're struggling to minister to one another for spiritual treasures, for spiritual benefits, for spiritual purposes, and instead are cleaving more to this physical world and getting uh, caught up in uh, the, the debauchery, the wickedness, the sinful living of this life, if we want sanctity, if we want purity, instead of this physical world, we need the Word of God. That is what makes ministry uh, possible. That's what allows us to lay aside the temptations of this physical uh, world. And uh, Paul will, uh, or the Hebrews writer, whoever that may have been, will kind of describe this for us in Hebrews chapter 12 and in verse 1. He says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. Well, when we look to Jesus, when we consider Him being the author of our salvation, uh, what is it that we need in order to maintain such a state? Well, we need the Word of God. It's to the Word of God. As the Hebrews writer will explain in chapter 5, And though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. If I want Jesus Christ to be my captain, if I want him to be the author of my eternal salvation, if I want to be able to have the same kind of attitude, the same kind of persistence and steadfastness that he had, even in the midst of persecution, even in the midst of difficulty, just as he was able to go to the cross and obey the Father, Likewise, I can do the same via the Word of God as I obey it, as I cleave to it. I can continue ministering to my brethren, serving the Lord. And so that's then how it is possible. Well, what is the way as to how members can minister when we consider this passage here in Colossians chapter 1? Colossians chapter 1. Uh, verses 1 through 8. Well, let's contemplate the latter part of verse 4. The latter part there of verse 4. In what way? In what way? Notice, uh, and of the love which ye have to all the saints. Notice also the beginning there of verse 6. Which is come unto you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit. So in what way? Do members minister? Well, they minister by loving the saints. They minister by bringing forth fruit, being fruitful in the Word of God and in service to Him. Uh, Luke will provide for us the account that Jesus gives concerning the parable of the sower in chapter 8. Uh, beginning there in verse 9, uh, we see that the disciples are asking, what does this parable mean? What does it be? And he says, unto you is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Well, none of us as members of the church fall in that category. We've all made the decision to be saved and have become members, and so therefore, that doesn't apply to us. But look here at verse 13. They on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy, and these have no root which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away. So they began obeying the word of God. They allowed themselves to initially uh, walk in God's word and make it possible to be able to serve, had joy in doing so, but 
we learn that they didn't have root, and after uh, believing for just a while, in time of temptation, they eventually fall away. Well, given the fact that it's Sunday evening, probably very few of us fall in this category. However, maybe some do, and so it's encouraging to be reminded there, verse 13, of the need for continual faithfulness and fruitfulness in the Lord. But notice as well, verse 14. And that which fell among thorns are they, which when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. Larry in his prayer discussed and described for us the great blessing of being able to be here together this evening. To be able to feast upon the spiritual richness in the presence of God as the body of Christ. Why? Why is it that we are interested in those kinds of things on a Sunday evening when football is going on and, and there's all kinds of errands and chores and things that we could be doing for us? Well, it's because when it comes to the seed, the Word of God, we're allowing it to be developed in our lives. We're allowing it to be cultivated and to grow because the cares of this life, the concerns of this world, the selfish pleasures and interests that we have for me, they take a back seat because God's Word and His kingdom is of much more significance to us. It was there to those brethren in Colossae. So in what way were they ministering to one another? They were loving one another. They were sacrificing for one another. They were putting the cares and the concerns of one another above their own selfish interests and concerns. And therefore, bringing forth fruit in uh, in their ministry, in their service. Uh, faithful and pleasing to the Lord. Okay, So where then is it that members can minister? Well, we just thought about it a minute ago. Looking once again at verse 12 of Luke chapter 8, it's when we make that decision to be saved. We can't uh, effectively minister to one another unless we first make the decision to become a Christian. Well, what about these folks in Colossae? Notice here in this passage in chapter two, uh, chapter 1 and in verse 2, he says, To all saints and faithful brethren, notice, in Christ. Well, they're in Christ. Notice as well the beginning there in verse 4. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Uh, folks, they are in Jesus. In other words, they are residing, they are maintaining their allegiance to Christ in their lifestyle. They first made the decision to be baptized into Christ, and then secondly, they're continuing to live in Christ in order to experience these spiritual blessings and create spiritual blessings for one another by ministry. Uh, Paul will explain to the brethren in Ephesus in chapter 1 and in verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, in Christ. Uh, folks, I can't have spiritual blessings outside of Christ. I can't have and experience the blessings of ministry, the blessings of the church, the blessings of salvation, the blessings of joy, of peace, of self-control, of love, outside of Christ. That's where God has placed those blessings. That's where those blessings are possible. And so uh, these folks in Corinth, they were Christians. They were in Christ. But when is it that they were ministering? When is it that they were ministering? In other words, uh, we've kind of already considered this going to Luke chapter 8. Did they minister for just a little while and then kind of phased out and just forgot about it? Or were they baptized first, but then took a honeymoon vacation? In other words, spiritually, hey, I was baptized, but now I'm just going to kind of ignore the Word of God, not really invest myself, not really engage much in the church, go live my life for me for a little while, but then eventually when 60 or so comes, I'll finally come back to the church. No, that's not what was happening at all. As a matter of fact, look with me here at the second part of verse 6. He says, Since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. What is it that they're doing? They're bringing forth fruit. What is it that they're doing? They're loving one another. Why is it that they're doing it? Because of the hope that's laid up for them in heaven above. 
Where is it that they stand? In Christ. How long have they been doing this? When have they been doing this? Since that day they heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. Well, what does it mean there, since hearing and knowing the grace? Well, think about uh, the brethren in Ephesus once again. We've already contemplated chapter 1 in verse 3. Uh, this letter probably was read to the brethren in Ephesus. If you consider chapter 4 and verse 15, the church there uh, and what was going to be read to the church of the Laodiceans, chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, possibly there the church in Ephesus is being uh, referenced. So go with me to Acts chapter 19 and think about first being in the grace of God. Uh, the folks in, in uh, Ephesus, the Ephesians, they had initially been baptized under John's baptism. They did not know anything concerning the gospel and the plan of salvation as it concerned Christ. And so Paul explains to them in verse 3 of chapter 19 in Acts, he says, unto what then were you baptized? He said unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance saying unto the people that they should believe on Him which should come after Him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul will then explain to the brethren in Ephesus, in chapter 2, uh, and in verse 5, he says, By grace ye are saved. He'll likewise say in verse 8, For by grace are ye saved. And so, uh, when is it that the Colossi brethren got to the point where they knew the grace of God in truth. Well, that point in which they were saved. That point in which they entered into Christ. That point in which they were baptized, just as Paul would go on to explain uh, regarding that very decision they made in chapter 2 and in verse 12, buried with Him in baptism. And so, have you been uh, in, buried in baptism with Christ yet? This evening, If not, you have the opportunity to do so. If you have already been baptized, but you're no longer ministering, you're no longer serving, you're no longer sacrificing for the church and for the Lord, you've given that up and you've gone back into the world, you're not hearing the Word of God, you're not applying the Word of God any longer, you're not hoping for heaven any longer, if that's the case, you need to come home. You need encouragement, you need prayers for the congregation, you need to be uh, restored and repent. We're here for you. We want to help you in any way that we can. Uh, and, we, and we give you and offer you that very opportunity to do so uh, as we uh, now take this, this time to stand and sing this song that was selected. Uh, if you have a need, please come forward. Let's all stand and sing. Sweet are the promises, kind is the word.